And so I wanted to begin this morning just to talk about the need for a united vision and uh, what I'm calling creating the next epicenter for missions, and that's theological education. Sometimes people think those two things are you know, mutually exclusive, theological education and missions, but I, I always say to people that I think that theological education is the handmaiden for church planting. I think that those two things go hand in hand. Um, weak churches don't plant churches, and if they do plant churches, they plant weak churches. And uh, we need trained leaders. We need developed leaders. We need people who are able to rightly handle the Word of God. And I think that for most of you, because of your prominent position as the, the leaders of the future movers and shakers in the convention, I think that as your institution goes, your convention goes. And the Baptist churches that you work with goes. And then from there, that's how the kingdom goes. And so I think that you are uniquely positioned uh, to be the next epicenter for missions. And there's a connection between the movement of the kingdom, I believe, and theological education, which is why we're having this meeting today. Um, Andrew Walls um, is been called by Christianity Today in an article in 2007, the most important person you've never heard of. Now, Christianity Today didn't know you were going to be here in this message because all of you probably know who Andrew Walls is. He's a missiologist. Uh, he, is, um, he is a writer, he's an author, and, uh, and he's a missionary. And, uh, but he is one of the ones who for decades has been saying that the center for Christianity is no longer in the West. You know, for years we thought of the West as the, the center of Christianity. But these days he has said, and so have many others like him, they've been saying for the past maybe 20 years or so, that the center of Christianity is leaving the West and is actually moving to the global south, places like South America and places like Africa. And uh, the West is no longer the center. And that's actually kind of the way that historically Christianity moves. It's interesting, if you look historically at Islam, you'll find that Islam tends to spread like an ink blot. You know, it, it will start in a particular area in the Middle East, and from there it has spread out further and further out. And the interesting, fascinating thing actually about Islam is that when it spreads out, the center gets harder and harder and more orthodox. Christianity is not really linear in that way but instead has been more like an earthquake, an epicenter. The, the first epicenter for Christian advance was Jerusalem. You read the book of Acts. You'll see the first church there in Acts chapter 2 comes together. And from there, they begin now to win people in Jerusalem. And people are going out from Jerusalem. And there was actually a, a persecution that broke out and caused people to move outward from Jerusalem, creating an epicenter for missions that only went a certain distance. The next kind of epicenter happened in Antioch. And then all of a sudden you see biblically in the book of Acts the center of Christianity being moved from Jerusalem more towards Antioch. They still looked back towards Jerusalem in a way. But these days if you go to Jerusalem you would not call that the center of Christendom. You would not say that's where the epicenter of Christian missionary advance is. We're now sending missionaries to Jerusalem not necessarily sending them from Jerusalem. Same thing is true with Antioch today. Sending missionaries to Antioch, not necessarily from there. Then North Africa actually became the epicenter for Christian missions advance. Augustine, church fathers, early patristics, you'll see that the Alexandrian movement and all of the, the way that that kind of became the center of the Christian world and missionaries were going out and the gospel was spreading from those places. That's kind of how Christianity is. It's like throwing a rock into a pond or into a lake. You, you, you take this rock and, and it's God who throws it. He throws it into a place and, and ripples go out in concentric circles from outside of that, of that center. That happened in Jerusalem. That happened in Antioch. Happened in North Africa. Then Europe. What was once pagan then becomes now the center of of Christianity and the center of Christian missions and Europe and after the Reformation then you go to England and you see all of these missionaries coming out and some of the first missionaries who came to Africa came from Great Britain yet if you go back today to England you'll find that England is one of the most godless nations on the planet 
and that most of the churches are empty, and now we're sending missionaries back to London to try to reach people in England. They are post-Christian. That's happened in Europe, happened in Germany, the heart of the Reformation, happened in France. All these places where we've seen Christianity thrive and develop. But here's the fascinating thing about that. The fascinating thing is that what happens with each one of these is that every time God throws the rock out and something incredible happens, some significant historical event occurs, and then it thrusts laborers into the harvest, every time what's fascinating to me is that their reach is a little bit further. The waves are a bit bigger, and they go and they consume more of the earth. The last great missionary advance came from the good old United States of America, where I'm from. I'm here today as a result of that. But you know what? If you go to the United States of America today, you would find, like England, a post-Christian nation. Don't let the number of Americans who are in this room fool you, my African brothers, to think that, Africa is a, that America is a Christian nation, because it's not. It's not. The vast majority of Americans do not know Jesus do not care about Him, do not attend church, have nothing to do with God, and it has become a godless society, and more and more falls kind of into the pit. But you think about the missions wave that came from America in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and you see this enormous movement of missionaries all around the world. And just like every time in history, from Jerusalem to Antioch to North Africa to Europe to North America, there's a big wave and then it wanes. Where does that leave us today? The Southern Hemisphere. And not only Africa, but Asia and beyond. What is a communist nation, China, is now sending missionaries all over the world. What was once a, a nation we sent missionaries to, South Korea, now you'll find more South Korean missionaries in Africa than just about any other uh, country. And you'll find that other places in the world who have now caught the gospel, who have now seen gospel advance in their churches, in their world, in their part of the world, they're now thrusting labors into the harvest. And that leads me now to Africa. I want you to see these statistics that come from the Pew Research Society. Um, it's kind of here, it's, it might be hard for you to see, but this is 1910, 2010, and then what est what's estimated in 2050. These are the number of Christians in the world, the world share of Christians. Now, how they define Christian could be debatable. It might include Catholicism and other things that we might not necessarily want to put in there. But the point is, is that if you look in Europe, in 1910, 66% of all the Christians in the world lived in Europe. And now, in 2010, only about 25%. And by 2050, it'll be 15.6% of all Christians in the world will live in Europe. Asia tends to sort of level off. Even Latin America, where there's been great missionary advance in South America and in that part of the world, it tends to level off. But look here at Sub-Saharan Africa. In 1910, 1.4% of all the Christians in the world lived here in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2010, 23.9% of all Christians in the world live in Sub-Saharan Africa. But it's estimated that by 2050, 38% of all Christians in the world are going to live here in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is Africa's time. God is at work on this continent. God is moving in His church. God is moving through people like you. God is moving through the people that you train and the people that you teach. God is moving through the churches that you influence and we see that continuing to, to advance. Now, there's some reasons for that. Part of that is because of the fertility rates. It's just a, a very interesting kind of milieu that's happening. If you'll look here, you'll see that Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, currently is leading the world in fertility rates, the number of people who are having babies. <laughs> and so you've got babies, more babies, Babies being born into Christian homes in sub-Saharan Africa than in any other part of the world. And so when we put all of these things together, when you look at the, the missionary history of Africa, when you look at the work of the denominations in Africa, when you look at the number of people who are coming to Christ in Africa, when you look at fertility rates and you put all
all of that into the big pot and you mix all of those things together, it leads us to conclude that the next epicenter for Christian history is going to be right here in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, Sub-Saharan Africa is fast becoming the new heartland for Christianity. You should say amen to that. You should thank God for that. Because God's allowing you to be in the middle of it. And not only that, it's fueled by birth rate, the history of missions, and the cultural milieu of Africa. But also, too, this window is temporary. That's the other thing I want you to take away from this presentation. Something amazing happened in Jerusalem, and then it was over. Something amazing happened in Antioch, and then it was over. Something amazing happened in North Africa, in Europe, in the United States of America, in North America, all around the world. And every time God does something bigger, He does something greater, He pushes His kingdom further out, He reaches more and more people, and it swells and it grows. And I really believe with all of my heart that we are standing at the fault line of the next epicenter of the great, next great wave of missionary advance not to come from America, not to come from England, not to come from Israel, but to come from right here in sub-Saharan Africa. You are at the center point of the next big thing that God's going to do in the world. You're at the starting line of the next big thing that God is going to do in the world. The feet that take the worldwide church across the finish line are African feet. And they're beautiful feet. The Bible says, How lovely are the feet of those who bring good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness, that our God reigns. And I believe that what God has done, God has positioned you, my African brothers, He's positioned your institutions, He's positioned your churches, He's positioned your denominations, He's positioned you to be able to literally finish the task to take the rest of the worldwide church across the finish line. And we're all looking at you. <laughs> we're looking at you and depending on you and trusting that you are going to finish what others have started. That you're going to take the gift that's been entrusted to you and you're going to push that gift out to the rest of the world. The implications are huge. The new potential epicenter of missions advance is outside our door. I don't mean somewhere else. I mean outside that door right there. That's where the next potential wave of missions advance is going to come from. The new center for theological influence. You see, I put whether good or bad. You're going to influence the world theologically. Now you can influence them for good or influence them for bad, but either way, you are going to be the next generation that shapes the future of theology in God's kingdom, whether for good or for bad. The future is in the hands of those among whom we live. The future is in the hands of our children. And they are not ready. They are not ready. That's why we're here. That's why we're in this room together right now. That's why it's important probably more important than at any other time in the history of the world, that we come together, especially we who are Baptists. We who are Baptists who hold that heritage, who understand what it means. I'm not saying that God doesn't use other evangelicals. He does. He does. And we need to work with them. We need to partner with them. But if we're going to start somewhere, let's start with us. Let's, let, let's point to ourselves and let's start with us. You know, there was a time in the world, there was a time in Africa, I think you remember this, when Baptists were known for being people of the book. You remember that? And then we stopped publishing, we stopped printing, we stopped emphasizing things like theological education, leadership development, all for good reasons trying to get to the lost. But I don't know that people say now that Baptists are people of the book. I'm not sure that we're the ones who are guiding the hearts and minds of men to be theologically sound. They're listening to Joel Osteen. They're listening to TBN. They're listening to TB Joshua. They're listening to all of those influences that they're hearing from 
the prosperity gospel from Neo-Pentecostalism. They're listening to, to Bonky. They're listening to all those people. That's who's guiding them and influencing them theologically. And I want to ask the question, where are the people of the book? We used to be the people of the book. I, I, I've, I've had Pentecostals. When I was a seminary professor in Lusaka, we would have Pentecostals who would come and they would learn at our school and they would say, yeah, no, we want to come here because we've heard that the one thing Baptists are known for, they teach the Word of God. They know the Word of God. They are grounded in the Word of God. And as I've traveled around and seen the state of the church in Africa today, the state of the Baptist church in Africa today, I'm not 100% sure we can say that now. And that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. They're not ready. Here's some personal observations I'm going to give you. Not from the Bible. <laughs> don't have a text for this. I don't have research for this. Just 20 years of, 21 years now of living in Africa, working in Africa, being a church planter, doing theological education, and this is where my heart is. This is where my home is, where I raise my children. The, these are my people. I love Africans. If I'm being honest, I don't want the Americans in this room to be offended, but I love them more than Americans. <laughs> I, I love Africans. And I'll tell you something that I've learned. Africans have the zeal that is necessary. If we're going to win the world to Jesus, if this is going to be the next center for theological advance, the next center for missions advance, if sub-Saharan Africa is going to be who God has positioned to literally finish the task and, and through His power win the world to Jesus, I think there's some reasons I can see that. Because number one, Africans have the zeal. They have the excitement. They have the encouragement. The other thing that Africans have is resilience. I have been in unimaginable places, in difficult places, in, in, in refugee camps in South Sudan, and seen people smiling. <laughs> After they have faced some of the greatest hardships, they deal with hunger, they deal with sickness, they deal with disease, and smiling. I was in Zambia uh, back in the 90s, early to mid-90s, before ARVs came. One of every... Four people were HIV positive. And in those days, we were having funerals in villages every day. It was literally affecting the, cult, the culture. The, it was like people were, as they say in Zambia, dying like chicks. That's how they would say it. it people were just, it, and, and it was, but yet people still smiled. People were still resilient, bounced back, strong. Africans have zeal. Africans are resilient. They have the ability to go to the toughest places, to the unreached places where no one's ever been. Africans have the heart to win the world of Jesus. I believe that. They've got the heart. Our churches, though, do not yet have the theological and logistical capacity to complete the task. You see, I think the issue that we have is not that we're not in the right place. I believe Africa's in the right place. It's not that we don't have the right people. I believe our churches have the right people. We've got the greatest people with the sweetest hearts, with the greatest zeal, with the strongest desire to serve God, with the willingness to do whatever it takes, to suffer whatever it takes to complete the task. But logistically, I'm talking about finances now. I'm talking about the ability to go to all those places. And theologically, I'm not sure that the African church has the capacity to finish the job today. Some churches are going to the nations, but honestly, most of our Baptist churches these days, I think, are more inwardly focused. They're thinking more about how are we going to grow ourselves how are we going to get more members? How are we going to pay our pastor? How are we going to finish this building program? How are we going to get an orphanage or maybe a, a community school so we can find more income for the church? How are we going to build our kingdom? Many of our Baptist churches, I think you would agree with that if you know them, most of our Baptist churches are more thinking about how they're going to 
develop their kingdom and solve their own problems, inwardly focused. Those are real important issues, but not necessarily thinking outwardly. And then we have aberrant theologies. I've mentioned some of those. Prosperity gospel, neo-Pentecostalism. There are other things you'll find, you know, um, different uh, cults that are there and, and all of these different voices. Here in Kenya, it's been an, I've only been in Kenya for two years, um, and it's been a real, a, a real education for me. You know, it, it's not the Baptist churches, but everybody has a ministry. And the longer the name, the more off base you know they are. <laughs> so there's the, you know, I, if you go down Banana Hill, you'll see all of these little tiny churches everywhere as you go towards Nairobi. And every one of them is, you know, the fire baptized, redeemed church of the altar. And you know, that's a problem. <laughs> You're thinking, that's, that, that's, that, there's a problem there. Um, we have these things impeding the African church's progress. And then, when we talk about our part in the whole issue, we talk about theological education institutions, it leads me to ask the question, well, what's our role? And we also have challenges. I think there are challenges that every one of you are facing in your institutions, which is making it difficult for you even to address these things. Even among our Baptist seminaries, we oftentimes have a lack of a shared vision, you know, an inward focus. In other words, we are concerned about the same things. How are we going to pay our salary and st our staff? How are we going to deal with our, our physical plant issues? How are we going to solve our relationship with the convention? And so most of our seminaries, oftentimes they, they, they live and they act in isolation from one another. So they're kind of autonomous which is a Baptist doctrine, but not cooperating. That's another Baptist doctrine. We sometimes forget that one. We need to hold both equally in our hands, autonomy and cooperation. But many of our seminaries have become more inward focused and have a lack of a shared vision. That's one thing I would love to come out of this meeting, that we would all go away from this meeting with a shared vision of this is who we are, this is why we exist, and this is where we need to go. And we all as Baptist seminaries are, are believing that and, and moving toward that. There's a lack of cohesion in strategy and purpose. Some of our institutions are not sure about what they're supposed to do or, or why they're supposed to do it or how they're supposed to do it even, but they just spend much of their time just trying to deal with the day-to-day -day crises they find. So they're moving from one crisis to another instead of having a strategic plan that says, this is where we're going, and this is what it will take to get us from here to, to, to there. Some of our institutions are facing a theological integrity crisis. We have Baptist seminaries who are oftentimes being drawn into liberalism. Even though, if, if I'll be honest with you, Africans have honestly been the one that's held the world away from that to a degree. The Methodist church... You know, I, before I was a Baptist as a child, I was raised in the United Methodist Church. And the United Methodist Church for years has been ordaining women to be pastors. They've been ordaining homosexuals to be pastors. They've been, you know, adopting some very ungodly things and allowing them to do that. And every time that they do, what they do is they will, it will be the Africans, <laughs> the Ma African Methodists who will say, no, we won't go down that road. We're not going to agree with homosexual doctrine. We're not going to agree with same-sex marriage. We're not going to agree with abortion. So as that church in the West continues to get more and more liberal, it's the Africans, Methodists, who are holding them to be more accountable to the Word. But what happens is that in many of our churches, in many of our institutions, in our seminaries, because we need partners, we need finances, we will oftentimes partner with whoever comes along. So you will find in Malawi, German Baptists, who do things that we wouldn't think were Baptist, but they come with money. Yes, we'll plus partner together. I'm just speaking plainly. Don't, don't let me um, embarrass anybody. Or you'll find that in other parts of the world, even Baptists who might not necessarily be Baptists who believe the Bible, but they are Baptists in name only, will come, and if they have finances, it's a temptation. Do we partner with them? 
And if we partner with them in order to get the funds, do we allow their theology to influence our theology? And the thing about these aberrant theologies like liberalism, neo-Pentecostalism, prosperity gospel, they're very incipient. And what I mean by that is that you don't always notice them there. You say to yourself, no, we're going to be very careful to protect our doctrine. We're going to stick to our, our Baptist heritage, our Baptist foundation. We're going to be conservative. We're going to believe the Bible. And even though we know these people don't believe like we do, we will accept their money and their partnership, but we won't let them influence us. But yet over time, over time, as they send people to come and teach, as they send volunteer teams to come and work with you, slowly but surely you find yourself veering off course. And you look up one day and you wonder, how did we even get into this place? It happens all the time. How many of you have ever shepherded sheep or cattle or anything like that? Goats. You know how the sheep gets lost? The sheep doesn't get lost because he wakes up one morning and decides, I'm going to go over there to that side of the mountain. I don't care what these guys are saying. Let me go there. No. The way the sheep gets lost is one blade of grass at a time. He sees this one delicious green piece of grass here, and the friends are here, and he says, let me go there. Just a few feet away, he eats some grass. He enjoys then he sees over there another delicious, you know, piece of grass. Let me go there. He eats. He enjoys. He looks. Oh, the friends are still there. He keeps doing that. And one by one, then he wakes up and he looks and he sees the friends are gone. And he's all alone. That's how the sheep get lost. That's how Baptist seminaries get off track. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, let's walk away from our foundations, from our heritage, from our roots. It doesn't happen that way. Instead, it happens by one small decision after another, bit by bit, one minor compromise after another. And then it leads to sometimes a theological integrity crisis. There's a transition from Western to African and the issues that accompany that. That's a big challenge that I know all of you are facing. Not all of the seminaries in this room were founded by the IMB, but some of those were founded by the International Mission Board. And I just want to say to you right now publicly, as a representative of the International Mission Board, we are sorry <laughs> for maybe the way that we nationalized, I put that in quotation, those seminaries, handed them over, some of those were smooth, some of those were not. Some of those you were prepared to receive, some of those you were not. But when you transition from a school that was started by well-meaning missionaries from the West, and now you want that school to no longer be Western but to become African, that creates issues. It creates issues that you have to pay, face support. Before, our support was coming from a mission board. But now we need our support to come from our National Baptist Convention or our National Baptist Union. But they look at us and they say, we didn't start you. The IMB started you. Go and talk to them. And it creates an issue because we are now trying to get African bodies to take responsibility for those seminaries. Some of you have done well in that area. Some of you are still struggling with that. And we are at some level responsible for that. Because we need to help you to think through how you transition and to be able to do that well. But that's a challenge that many seminaries are facing. Where will our support come from if our convention has not yet bought in? They need to be the ones to support, but sometimes they're slow to buy in. Models and forms. Many times you inherited a Western model or a Western form of this is how we do theological education and you're realizing maybe that's not the best method in Africa. Maybe that's not the best way to do things in an African way. So that transition from a Western mindset to an African mindset, which is good, it's a good thing, but it creates challenges. Pragmatism. Let's just do whatever we can to keep things running. And sometimes it causes us to, to make bad choices. Pedagogy. Another word for that, andragogy. It's how we teach. 
I don't know about you, but I'm always tempted to teach others the way that I learned. Well, the way that I learned might not be the best way for me to teach those in an African context. It could be that people who are living in an African context might learn in a different way. They might understand in a better way. And it's my job as the teacher to adjust myself to my students, isn't it? But we always want the students to adjust to us. So what we do is we just continue to propagate that. So I learned in this style. You're also going to learn in that style. I was joking with one of our professors from Southeastern Seminary. When I did my Ph.D. at Southeastern, uh, the man who was over the Ph.D. department, uh, German was his first language. <laughs> and, um, and English was his second language. And so I was doing a Ph.D. in missions on the mission field. And I went and made, uh, I tried to, to make an appeal uh, to the doctoral department to say, okay, I understand that I'm going to have to, to do either German or French or Latin. But I'm asking because the rule was you had to have two languages, you know, two other languages. And German was necessary and then French or Latin. And so I went and made the appeal and said, look, I'm living in Zambia. I'm writing my dissertation in Zambia. I will need Chichewa in order, because that's what I'm fluent in. I will need Chichewa in order to be able to, to complete this dissertation. So I'm appealing that you allow either French or Latin, one of those, to be replaced by Chichewa. And they said, no. And so then I went in to find out why that appeal had been denied. And uh, this dear man said, brother... As long as I am in charge of this Ph.D. department, everybody will have to do German and either French or Latin. And I said, but I don't need to do anything in German. That doesn't matter. <laughs> you have to do German or French or Latin. And sometimes what we do, I think, is that whatever we go through, we want others to suffer the way we suffer. <laughs> I think that's, that's the real issue. Because later, by the way, they changed that rule. And I did German and I did Chichewa. Chichewa was my other language I had to test out of for my dissertation. And that was fine. But the, but the th funny thing is, is that now I've heard they're even considering dropping German. And I'm also saying, what is wrong with these people? Why would they drop German? No, it's not a real PhD if you don't have German. It, that, that's, that's, I think that's our human nature. Whatever we, whatever we suffer through, we want those who come after us to also suffer through that. And I would just say that when we think about how we teach, we need to teach in the way that brings the greatest meaning and understanding to our students. And so that's a challenge. That's a challenge when we go from a Western-influenced seminary to an African-influenced seminary. Also, buy-in from national bodies. I've mentioned this. It's a big challenge. If our Baptist unions... Because, let me say this, the issue is not money. Can I say that again? The issue is not money. We saw this morning in the sermon, the issue is not money. God is there. And money is there. And even our Baptists have the money. The issue is not money. But we need our National Baptist Conventions and our National Baptist Unions to buy into the seminary. To say, we believe the seminary is important. We believe the, the seminary is beneficial. And we believe the seminary is ours. It's our institution. Let us support our institution. I think that's probably more than anything else what we're lacking. Is that buy-in and support from our national bodies. So there are challenges that we're facing. So I've got here, don't worry. <laughs> but these are the questions that keep me up at night. When I'm up at night thinking and praying about this, this potential for missions advance in Africa and what God can do through you and what God wants to do through you, the two questions that keep me up at night is, will Africa go to the world? And can Africa go to the world? In other words, are they able to go to the world? Do they have the theological, logistical capacity to go to the world? And then the second one is, when we go, what gospel will we export? When we send to the world, when the majority of missionaries in the world are Africans, and that day is coming, 
what gospel are they going to be taking to the world? Will they be taking T.B. Joshua's gospel to the world? Will they be taking Joel Osteen's gospel to the world? Will they be taking T.D. Jake's gospel to the world? Robert Tilton? I mean, the names are endless. Or will they be taking Jesus' gospel to the world? I worry about that. We have the potential to see God do the most amazing thing in all of history, right here, right now, in all of church history, right here, right now, amongst us and in this world. But these two issues are the ones we have to answer. And I think that the answer for will they go and can they go, and when they go, what gospel will they export, I think you're the ones with the answers to that. I think theological education institutions in Africa are the ones that hold the keys to unlocking the potential of the African church in the world. That's why this meeting is so crucial. So, I'm proposing this morning a revisioning of theological education. A revisioning of theological education for us this week and for us into the future. A vision that is comprehensive. Where you're thinking about theological education at all levels. Not only at the seminary level. But how is the seminary influencing in local churches in discipleship? How is the seminary influencing decentralized theological education and Bible schools? And how is the seminary growing and affecting at the national level? A comprehensive, all levels. How is the seminary contributing to producing the next African theologians of tomorrow? The next African writers of tomorrow? With a missional focus where we're thinking missionally and it's not only about growing the seminary, but it's about reaching the world for Jesus. I think we need a, a vision that's cohesive, interrelated and connected, where we're connected to one another, where we're interrelated to one another, where we partner with each other, where we're not out there on our own trying to do what we think is right for that moment in that place. That's important. But where we're also helping one another, co-laboring together as Baptist seminaries. One that's collaborative across sub-Saharan Africa. I, I said to you earlier, I hope that someday that we will see thousands of delegates come to an Africa Baptist Theological Education Network meeting representing not only Baptist seminaries but Bible schools and other denominations that are like-minded and seeing this groundswell of theological education advance that will literally push the church out into every corner of the globe. One that's contextualized, not, not Western, but one that's African, flexible, and local. So where we have a network or, or a coalition, a vision that we vision together where you have the freedom to be who you are, where you are, but you collaborate and partner together to see us do more together than we can do alone. Isn't that what really is unique about Baptists? I mean, probably the thing I, I, that I love the most about being a Baptist is that we love and value autonomy, but we also equally value cooperation. We are not an island to ourselves, but we cooperate together. And then a vision that's committed Accountable and aggressive. That's what I mean by committed. Accountable and aggressive. Accountable to our conventions. Accountable to each other. Accountable to the Word. Accountable to the world and the church at large. Dr. Ebele Adioye, who is from Ivory Coast, who we hope has landed and is on the way. He's who we're waiting for. When I met with him in his church um, in Yamasukra, we, we sat together and we talked about this this vision about this idea. He longed 
for there to be some kind of a Baptist coalition or, or network or association that could help with issues like accreditation, that could help with issues like accountability, so that we could keep each other accountable. And if there was a school that was going off course theologically, doing things that might not be consistent with Baptist sound doctrine, that someone else that could speak into that and say, look, brothers, this is who we are. This is what we believe. This is our foundation. He was longing for that, for his institution. We need accountability to each other. We need accountability to the world and to the church at large. You have something to offer the world. And you're accountable for that. It's a stewardship that God has given you. So I've got a dream. This is it. This is the end. We're coming to the end of this presentation. That's an old Martin Luther King quote. I have a dream. And this is my dream. In this dream, I see African Baptists writing the next great theological works. Instead of us arguing over whether we're going to use Erickson or Grudem as our systematic theology, I see a day when we're actually using a systematic theology that was written by an African scholar of today. And that's what people are arguing about. And actually, in my dream, that systematic theology makes its way back to America and replaces in those seminary classrooms as well. I have a dream. In this dream, I see a return to biblical orthodoxy in Africa, and I see African Baptists leading the way. Now, you have to forgive me. I, I see this as possible because I come from the Southern Baptist Convention. In America, it's the only denomination that was heading down the road to liberalism and literally turned around and went the other direction. There was a day in Baptist seminaries in America where we had professors who were denying the virgin birth of Jesus, who were denying the resurrection of Jesus, who were denying some of the key, orthodox, crucial parts of the gospel. And what happened was local Baptist churches at the grassroots level said, no, this is not who we are. And they created what was called the conservative resurgence, and they literally took back the denomination from those who had driven it down the road to liberalism. And you look at Methodists, you look at Presbyterians, you look at Episcopalians, they all continue to go down that road. And only Southern Baptists have turned the corner and begun coming back the other way. So I know it can be done. I know it can be done. I don't care how off base these cults are, it doesn't matter to me how many words are in the blessed redeemed church of the living altar of Zion. Doesn't, none of that matters to me because I know the God that I serve and I believe in you and in these Baptist institutions and I believe that if we will cling to God, just like Hezekiah laying that on the altar before God, I believe that God can do a miracle among Baptists. And I believe that we can have a day 20 years from now where we look back upon a reformation, maybe that's not a good word, but, but a revival, a, a theological revival of sorts that took place in Africa where actually the prosperity gospel was defeated by Africans, not embraced by them where Neo-Pentecostalism was defeated by Africans, not embraced by them. And where we see that there was a correction in the course of these aberrant theologies that came and went the other way. And it was because of you and because of your faithfulness to God and because of your work through your institution and Baptists led the way that spread to other evangelicals. I'm dreaming that. In this dream, I see Africans leading at the round table of theology and shepherding the West back to biblical roots and revival. It's not only Africa that's off track, brothers. Sisters, it's not only Africa. It's America. It's Europe. It's all the rest of the world. And I would love to see this place become the center of what God's doing in the world theologically, and literally it being Africans who go back to America 
and teach them the Bible correctly. <laughs> we need that. We need that. In this dream, I see Africans covering the planet in gospel witness and leading us to finish the task. By leading us, I, I don't mean us. I mean the worldwide church. I mean all believers in the world. I see Africans leading out in that missionary task, thrusting laborers into the harvest field, going to the most difficult places in the world, supported by African churches back home that are sending, that are working together to send their missionaries out into the world, reaching the lost of the lost. I see African Baptists planting Baptist churches in Afghanistan among Afghani Muslims in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, overturning ISIS with the truth. God can do that. God can do that. In this dream, I see it starting right here, right now, in this moment, in this place, with you. That's the vision that I have. It's not my job to carry it out. It's just my job to cast it. I'm trusting you brothers to pick it up and to run with it. It's difficult. It's difficult because you're in this room and the people you're going to have to convince are not in this room. <laughs> so you have to catch it. You have to believe it. You have to own it. And then you have to go out and you have to cast it for others. But it's really not about what's outside the walls of Jerusalem. It's not about the army we see. It's not about the circumstances. It's about who's on the throne. <coughs> who's on the throne? And do we really, really believe that? Do we really believe that God is on the throne? Do we live like He's on the throne? Do we have faith and trust in Him like He's on the throne? Do we walk around as servants of a sovereign God? Or do we live lives defeated and overwhelmed by all the obstacles that we see? God wants to use you. He can use you. Those are the feet that we need to empower, we need to train, we need to send out. That's who's going to do it. And all I'm asking you today is to just say, God, I'll do my part. It's my job to send them out. I'll prepare them. I'll train them. I'll join them. I'll lead them. I'll model for them. I'll teach them, I'll go with them, I'll be an example, I'll do all those things, but we as Baptists, we as institutions, we as believers, we are going to join hands together and we are going to win the world for Jesus by God's grace, by God's power. We're going to do that. I think if we band together, we can do more than we can do, than we've done on our own. That's what I believe. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. God, I thank you for these men and women, these servants of the Most High God, that you have chosen, divinely chosen, to be in this place, to be in this time, to hear this word, to be at this conference to get things that are going to help their churches be, I mean, their, their churches and institutions be healthier, to hear things that are going to help their seminaries to thrive, to collaborate, to partner, to grow. God, this is your work. You will be exalted among the nations. God, you will be exalted on the earth. I pray, God, that you would allow us to be a part of exalting you. God, help us to be faithful in exalting you in our works, in our schools, in our life, in our witness. 
God, I pray today that you would do something unique in the hearts and lives of these men and women. I pray, God, that you would bind people's hearts together. I pray, God, that you would create a common purpose, a common vision. I pray, God, you would create a commitment, a desire to want to, to move forward together, a desire to want to, to go with you, to serve with you, and to be faithful to you. God, we are trusting you with this work and asking you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.